What's up, everybody? This is Illiterate. This week, we're taking a stroll down the staircase. My name is Evan. I checked out the HBO Max series. I am up to date. And my name is Taylor, and I looked at Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure. <laughs> we're getting deep. <laughs> Uh, something is happening around the story of the staircase, whether you are a fan, uh, you know, uh, somebody who's watched the entire old series, the documentary, or somebody who's never heard of this. This one is interesting. This one cuts through our true crime stuff. We've covered a couple things like adjacent to this. Something is happening around this story. Uh, right now, the HBO Max series is showing the behind the scenes making of that documentary and calling into question perhaps its credibility. And so this reporting has kind of broken open this whole story. Uh, it's kind of a food fight as the uh, episodes <laughs> are airing. So we're only on episode five. There's going to be uh, several more episodes that come out on Thursday night. So I just binge the entire thing so I could get up to speed. I've seen the original doc. Uh, right. And I when, they, when I saw the ads for this, I passed on it. We, me and my wife, we saw the doc. We were like, nah, we don't need to see the dramatization of it. Guys, this is so ev anything but just the flat out <laughs> adaptation of that docu series. So, we are going to cover the staircase. We're going to take you through the original trial <laughs> and what in yeah. the world is happening with this series and how nobody knew until last week that all this was happening. My God. Right. <laughs> yeah, very strange adaptation. And we won't get into all the twists and turns of the case because that's what's been covered so much. Right. And, and there's plenty of other podcasts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the documentary itself. That was the whole point. But this is like Evan we'll said. We'll give you a once over. Yeah. Yeah. But this is a the, what what we're covering is a treatise on why they're now calling the documentary into question through a fictional dramatized account with actors that have won Oscars. Yeah, uh, like it's some of the best actors. What they've done with the role of Kathleen Peterson even is like everything else centered around this case. She is she's like, gone. It takes place yeah. after. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Tony Collette plays her and she's in every episode and a significant portion of it. And they are doing wonderful things with her character. And I think that's one of the main reasons probably this got going. But it is so not what you're thinking it is. And, and I'm glad I'm glad this reporting hit because I would have totally passed on it and we wouldn't be doing it as the show. <laughs> yeah, but a bizarre our adaptation let's start with the original documentary and how that got put together in the early 2000s so the creator jean javier de l'estrade is a french documentarian and so originally i'm like well how in the world is he in durham north carolina Right. Filming. Seems totally yeah. random. Usually these types of things, when you get like a justice system, you know, on a, surrounding a particular case, usually it's, it's a local kind of thing. A, a regional filmmaker will mm -hmm. tag on to it and that'll kind of propel them onto a bigger stage. So something just from France, this is totally <laughs> out of the ordinary. Yeah. So he had won the Oscar for best documentary called Murder on a Sunday Morning, which came out in 2001. Mm. And this was the Brenton Butler case in Florida, 15 year old boy wrongfully accused of murder. And the documentary shows through his case and his eventual acquittal. And this opened wow. up a lot of conversation around the videotaping of police interrogations because he was abused really? into confessing, even though he didn't do it. And then they actually caught the people who did. Wow. But it was just kind of like, oh, there's an eyewitness. And they said that he did it. And then the police bullied him into confessing. And wow. so this this covers all of that. And so that's this, been a, I mean, that we've been seeing that more and more uh, covered in documentary since making a murder. I feel like any time if, if you can get this on camera because it happens so much more often than anybody realizes. I feel like now that people are trying to find these instances because it's actually some of the most shocking and even hard to articulate pieces of like crime work because they don't know what's happening to them in the room. Yeah. Um, so it, over the last like eight years, it's been particularly interesting to see this get a lot more scrutiny in terms of what is admissible, what is a, actually a real confession versus yeah. something that's completely coerced. Yeah, exactly. So that's what his original doc did and won an Oscar for. And so his next thing, he wants to examine the criminal justice system as a whole, but through the opposite lens of a white man able to afford the best defense he possibly can, like the opposite situation he mm -hmm. wanted to present. So they went looking to try and find this. It wasn't they heard about this. They they knew this is what they wanted to follow up with mm. in almost like a series about the American criminal justice system. So right. they go through 300 different cases that are pending or about to happen, five months of research until this Michael Peterson case comes about. 
there is a specific producer, Alison Luchak. She is on the ground in Durham. She's French, tracking the criminal justice stories, spending hours on the phone with everyone mm. negotiating and yeah. then maintaining these relationships for a decade as this thing progressively gets more and more strange and the twists and the cover-ups and all of that wow. stuff. She is not in the show. They composite her character as one of the older white male producers, Ponset, who is Got you. over okay, there. Yes, yes. He was not nearly as much involved, and she is, this is sort of one of the situations of, we should say this is a fictionalized account, because she was like, so many of the young female producers that I mentored based on this and the demands as a new mother, she had spent so much time in Durham, North Carolina, that when she returned to wow. France, she said her son didn't even recognize her. She poured so much Man, into this. And then I'm almost she's feeling not, like, yeah. while I, while as a creative, I understand, you know, you have to consolidate to a degree. The producer that they go with, the, the composite, has much less drama in terms of what I'm hearing. If it could have mm -hmm. been this this parallel female kinship and like that would have been way more drama have these <laughs> right. you know have have the two women and then the director not on the outside of like what's happening oh yeah, that's a, a little bit more true to what it to what it was i i see the pair mm -hmm. the two women parallel there heightens that a lot more than what i think what they ended up landing with i totally understand yeah having to composite but man there's part of me that wishes like wishes that instead of just that disgruntled male producer that it was like another woman who who is like away from her children and is stressed out, but really sees something yeah. here and then, oh no, what's happening? Well, and that's what she was saying. It's like, in a way, she's glad that she's not being mm -hmm, fictionalized mm -hmm. without her consent, but at the same time to substitute it with something far less purposeful as her <laughs> career was, like just doesn't, right, right. doesn't seem to fit. But so, you know, they, they find this, yeah. she finds this case with, Lestrade and they meet with the district attorneys. And after 15 minutes, Lestrade said, one of them said to him, you know, Michael Peterson is evil. And he yep. was like, evil. Wow. Like that's, that's crazy. Like, wow. and of course, eventually the case becomes in his mind as the documentarian director. Oh, this is then definitely more about who he is, the values that he represents in the community, not necessarily the physical evidence. Like they've already decided that he's evil. <laughs> and they you know God. talk to me for 15 minutes <laughs> that's that's there's something to this that has to do yeah. more with the people and what he represents than the case and the clues and all of that stuff right. so and then another thing that i don't think people realize is that that he was intended to film both sides the prosecution and the defense but after three months the prosecution wouldn't let them film anything related to that. really yeah. So like in the first episodes of the original documentary, you can see both sides more. But then people are like, oh, well, then why did you side with Michael? And it's like, because well, they because, shut us out because he was the only one that we could wow. film consistently. So I think that that's also part of uh, something that gets a little misconstrued. I did not know that. Memories. Yeah. I mean, and, and for anybody who doesn't know what we were kind of talking around Michael yeah. Peterson and Michael Peterson is uh, is a, an author and oh, he's trying to run for city council. He's very these respected, for mayor actually kind of an, yeah. an, an, oh gosh uh <laughs> and he's he's affluent we'll call it that they live yeah, in this yeah. great house he has his big family he loves he just loves wine and culture and blah 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 and so he lives in durham north carolina now we went to school in north carolina love north carolina been to durham went to film festivals in durham love durham but at the same time i can understand where somebody like michael peterson this affluent wine loving just kind of eccentric you know joe he artist sucking person. a little bit too yeah. Art, artist yeah exactly he's sucking a little bit too much attention uh he got maybe the maybe the homosexual vibes are leaking out and people are suspicious of that and in durham north carolina that will definitely get people looking into you a different way especially 20 years ago let's not forget the time that's passed since yeah um but uh th this is one of the big factors is this is kind of a fish out of water it's like this guy should have moved to france like he said he wanted to or gone to san francisco because those are where he would have been accepted ultimately this is like i just don't feel like this community really uh, accepted him at all <laughs> yeah and like you had mentioned with attention on him like uh, that becomes a point of interest in the case is that his career as an author is kind of like well if anybody can spin a yarn it's him you know it, it already draws into question his reliability and then like you said those lying artists yeah <laughs> or like you said it's like it came out that he was bisexual 
And uh, then right. that was also like, oh, why is he keeping it a secret? And it's like, well, look at is the time your and business? place. I don't, you yeah. know, exa- and yeah. again, 20 years ago, but it's yeah. it's so it's so hard for 20 years ago, Durham typical like even the prosecution is so so hard on trying to paint it like how could his wife have known about this and been okay (laughs) yeah (laughs) some of my favorite stuff because that really is what the vibe is like but what we know now is that like people are really complex marriages are incredibly (laughs) complex (laughs) like this you're not even beginning to scratch this the surface of just humanism just being human (laughs) yeah so um they're trying to paint it with all that stuff and i just don't know this stuff really sticks in terms of like murderer (laughs) right i mean yeah and that's the thing it's a forever question of did he didn't he i mean equal on both sides but in terms of like we're talking about motives and you're trying to pin all these things on him there's equal shade thrown in other directions so it's like in right conjunction with his writing novels he also wrote as a columnist for the durham herald sun where he explicitly criticized the police and specifically the district attorney who would later prosecute him and call him evil so there's a potential, you know, you it's like, it, again, you're making yourself a target and a place yeah. that just doesn't like your kind. There's like motive on both sides for both. Re- you know, it's it's right. evenly balanced as the situation progresses. So, yeah, th- this is all very interesting to De La Strade, the French filmmaker. Yeah. In 2004, this wins the Peabody Award. It's, I mean, yeah. God, what a microcosm of America. And if you think, about yeah, it, just like <laughs> really, I mean, down to the, just the person to person one to one aspect. Wow. And what was crazy for this at the time and almost set a precedent a decade too early is the sort of true crime miniseries, because this was eight episodes because they had 800 hours of material, I believe, total. You know, this was the way to go, really paving the way for this. This didn't go to streaming and nobody binged this on, you know, on some website. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. uh, (laughs) Just thinking about even distributing this back 20 years ago in eight part like this, like where would that, where would you have even seen it? I haven't even thought about that. You would have had to go to like someone playing the first screening. It would have to air weekly. Yeah. It was on TV and then in a couple different places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was, yeah, it was a new thing for the time. And uh, just, for those that don't know, I mean, he was sentenced to life in prison. He was found guilty, which was so shocking. They released all this after because they have interviews of him when he's in prison. You know, like it's they had to wait. Mm-hmm. It wasn't like we're doing this live and releasing the episodes weekly and people are tuning in. Right. It's not no, like no, 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 no. the OJ trial where it was happening. But with all of that, it got, rev- you know, rave reviews for its careful construction, because that's the whole point. It it, it does leave you uncertain. He's an odd guy. The situation could also have been odd. He could have been the luckiest guilty man or the unluckiest innocent man, you know, (laughs) and people don't know how that works out. Um, and Michael Peterson just in the middle, just well, well you know, that's the way yeah. the cookie crumbles. He just he just like talks away anything. <laughs> well, so I speaking to sorry, I we're making light of it, but like there was actually a mockumentary series that came out in 2017 called <sighs> trial and error on NBC. And it follows this hotshot New York lawyer who moves to this small town in South Carolina. (laughs) And the first season parodies this whole thing. And it's like, he's trying to help this guy who just keeps doing things to make him look more and more guilty. (laughs) Um, I've got got, to go watch that. It got good reviews. Yeah. The second season follows a a well-to-do woman. It's like different cases each season. It only lasted two seasons though, but, uh, Maybe it's on Peacock. I don't know where it is, but like it's it got to the place. Yeah. Where this was being parodied for all of the (laughs) the twists and turns. The the first one being that this returned to being filmed in 2012 with two more episodes, because after almost eight years of being in prison, there was a retrial because an expert witness had lied under oath from the first part. It's like the man had served eight years in prison for murder. And then two more episodes come out about it. And then three new episodes were made for Netflix in 2018 when it finally went to the final trial and he had the Alfred plea, which is right. like he's accepting guilt. And the yeah, and the state is like accepting that perhaps that there wasn't intentional, but like you're guilty, but we'll let you go. Right. In a way <laughs> it's, where it's, it's very like, sticky, hey, yeah, yeah, it's like I there, I'm pleading innocent, but there is too much evidence to not right. convict, et cetera. So, yeah. So he's out. He's he's out in the world now. But yeah, I, all of this looking into all the twists and turns of it led me to think about and especially with like the Johnny Depp Amber Heard stuff going on. I was like, when 
can people be it, videotaped yeah. in court? Like it, it just brings when up. When is it okay to watch a trial and how, under what conditions is it like, are they filmed and who decides what can be, what can be on TV and what can't? Cause uh, I always I've thought it was really never, thought about it. Yeah. Like the, you see the sketches. I feel like a, uh, I'm not, I'm sure I'm not, I know you got the facts, but I'm like judges. I know to a certain extent set their own rules, but like, other than that, whether what the legality is or what the proper channels are and at what level it, it it can be or can't be. Yeah. So the biggest thing that started all this was the trial of Bruno Hauptmann, who was prosecuted for the kidnapping and murder of the Lindbergh baby in 1935. Oh, God. And this was a this was a disaster. 700 media members, 120 cameramen in the courtroom like and this is hilarious to me, but like blinding witnesses with flash bulbs climbing over tables, just a disaster. In the, it just looks <gasps> just like can't see. <laughs> yeah, it's horrible. So this then becomes about the federal rule of criminal procedure. Number 53 is the one we're talking about, what I looked into, which after this expressly prohibits electronic media coverage of anything. Nobody can come in and do this. This is then where the you have to have a sketch artist. Um, okay. Because of the disaster. Although this is the on, on the federal level. So shortly thereafter, Texas gave judges discretion, which is what you're talking about, the specifics on a state level, not a federal level. Right. We're going to decide. But in 1965, there was a big finance swindler case, Estes versus Texas. And the Supreme Court overturned because the camera did distract participants in a way that deprived this guy of a fair trial. Oh, wow. To the point where they were like, yeah, this really messed up everything. And they were like, we have to base this on the current technological abilities, not what's going to happen later. This is obtrusive filming this. So this then went about to almost like 20 years of denying access in this way. This kind of became the precedent of you can't really do stuff like this. Although, like you're saying, it's still mm -hmm. minimal state by state, case by case. Although a thing that opened it up then was Chandler versus Florida in 81 because Florida had this pilot program since the 70s of like, you could do this without consent of people, trying it out again. And there were defendants that objected in a certain case. And the Supreme Court then said, well, now the tech is not as obtrusive. This didn't actually affect bah. you. It's fine. Yeah. So Ugh. it kind of went seesawed back and forth. But as of 2006, all states have, they can allow some type of camera, but it's stricter depending on the state. So 16 basically disallow it completely, but it is wow. very much up to the state, the judge, the content and the trial, but the federal decision has not been renewed. So then like in something like the Amber Heard, Donny, uh, Johnny Depp stuff. Like yeah. That's up to the state. Is that on purpose? You yeah, know? yeah. Because that's up to the state. <laughs> you know, and the judge it has and, to be it, obviously. Yeah. But I'm just like that. Yeah. It's it's that's what it calls into question. Is like the everyday person sees Johnny Depp up on the stand and goes, "Well, there are no cameras when I pay my partner <laughs> fine." You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. When I contest my speeding ticket, yeah. I it, want I want to be on TV yelling at the police. Yeah. <laughs> I was, it was 33 shooting. and a 35. Yeah. Yeah, so it is. That, that's kind of what sucks. And there's constantly, like, like I said, Florida had done these tests. They call them like pilot situations where they try it in certain courts and for certain things, and then it goes. That situation then goes to court to decide whether it affected anything. So it's constantly being tested, but as of now, definitely not in any federal cases. Mm -hmm. You know, and the Supreme Court has audio, I believe, that they started doing, and started even streaming it during the pandemic, during 2020, versus oh, wow. just releasing it That's after. really cool. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, so that's then leads us to this current thing, the HBO filmmakers getting all of right. this footage where everybody agreed and there was rules on the prosecution and defense that you couldn't release it until after everything was done because we don't want to mess with an appeal that might happen, which eventually did happen based on the documentary. So like it did work in their favor. But this was my this was my question just with everything that happened last week and why we're doing the episode. I, I go. So now the French filmmakers are up in arms, absolutely mm -hmm. vehemently upset about what has happened because they were under the impression that they were getting in it. They were turning over material for an adaptation of their documentary. What they realize as the episodes start airing is that they are characters in this drama show about the process of making that documentary, not mm -hmm. telling the story of the documentary. Right. Um, and it kind of blasts open from there. 
So uh, immediately, uh, my mind goes to how was this pitched and sold to what audience? Because when right. you do something like this, they did not know what they were handing over this material for. So they were told probably next to nothing, but they were told something different from what Tony Collette is told signing on <laughs> to star is Kathleen Peterson, who's got to fall down the stairs three or four times in right. different ways and like create a, you know, like the, I know Tony Tony Collette is sold because of the French uh, the filmmakers are a yeah. part of this and you're going to be, we're going to do it from all these different sides and we're going to pay a, a lot of attention to the forensics of that's how it was sold to her. It was sold to the French filmmakers in a different way, but I, I want to hear some specifics yeah. on this. So this, is, this uh, is pretty audacious. <laughs> it's pretty brave. Yeah. The specifics that I can find are almost like the trial itself where it's like, well, this side is saying this and this side is saying this, and they're both exactly. equally valid. So Lestrade sold the rights to Antonio Campos, who's the show co-creator, gave him access to the hundreds of hours of the archive. And Lestrade in interviews said, we gave him all the access we wanted. This is horrible. I really trusted the man. He believed that he was going to do right by him, according to him, and treat the documentary with respect and not question their judgment in the creative process. There was a clause in his contract that Lestrade would be a co-executive producer and could be involved in the writing, but he hmm. uh, didn't see that oversight as necessary because he trusted Antonio. That's so what I much. read. Is exactly. Yeah. He didn't. Exactly. Exactly. And so Antonio, well, how does he get all of this? license if this is such a closed you know loop of this is all this stuff that we worked on for so long he had begun work on adapting this 13 years ago was super invested in peterson's oh, wow. thing he attended the second trial like he's there in the Whoa. background of the documentary are you kidding me oh no, my god yeah yeah oh my god i did not know this so he's in so deep and that's why they gave him the license presumably to do what he wanted with the documentary wow. footage yeah uh yeah. And I, I, you know, I tried to look, I was looking at like the Charlotte Observer and like local North Carolina stuff. And they mm -hmm. said that HBO resp stopped responding to interview requests with him specifically and the creative team. But I did see some quotes, you know, they're like, and, and it's hard because there's a balance too. They said, oh, well, we have to take creative liberties because if we didn't, we couldn't create a drama. You know, like there right. are, we've talked about tons and tons, those sorts of, sometimes you have to burst through them to have a story that you want to tell exactly or take it a you have way. to lie a little bit to tell a greater truth right uh, and, and that that's exactly what is kind of called into question with this is okay so if that's true I, we're seeing it for the first time in this context we're seeing uh the documentary be dissected and dramatized lied a little bit ba made bigger so that at the end of it maybe we are left with the right question the real right questions in terms of like, well, I don't think he did it. The, yeah. Well, do we know? Can we be sure? You know, like if if you and that was why we we're doing this is like if you if you were somebody that thought you knew all of this is I think basically everything you thought you knew can go right out the window yeah. until we get to the end of the series and we we hear a little bit more from all of these sides. Um, Definitely. Well, one of the things that then really blew everything open is Sophie Brunet, I believe that's how you pronounce her last yes. name, but she is the editor. I guess what was big news to people was that she had a relationship with Michael Peterson. The Exactly. That's has know, been what I've been yours. dancing around the kernel right. in it all. So we find out the person that is really constructing it and constructing the narrative. I mean, literally sitting down and constructing it. The editor of the documentary is engaged in a romantic relationship with him. Um, yeah. Which is, is just... Uh, I I'm I'm kind of baffled by it. I mean, I understand why it's exploding, but I know you found something yeah. that explains why maybe this is kind of old news. Well, yeah. So news. <laughs> so uh, Michael Peterson had written a book called Behind the Staircase: All Profits Go to Charity, where that's in the title of the book, and it's in the public <laughs> domain. If you do buy it on Kindle or paperback or whatever it does, it came out in 2019. So he had been released. He had taken the Alfred plea, and he's out. And I skimmed over this. He heavily documents, I mean, most of it is him in prison because that's eight years of his life that he spent. It, it covers a little bit of the trial, but it's a lot. It's, I mean, if you want to learn about the prison system in the United States and this guy's experience, that's mostly what it is. 
Um, That's where we are in the show right now. I've caught yeah. up to the uh, the newest episode was released last night as of this recording. So I'm caught up and that's exactly where we are. We've gotten past the first trial and he is in prison and his relationship with Sophie is beginning to actually take shape and form. Um, yeah. So th we if, this t if that tells you anything, we're only halfway through the series and we're past the purview of the original documentary already. Yeah. And so that's kind of, I think, where people take or the French filmmakers take issue with it is because she didn't even know him during the filming. She right. started by writing letters to him in prison. And in terms of the timeline, I know that that's kind of, like you said, she was responsible for it. She left five months before the editing was completed and a full year before the release. And she never edited the trial footage. There were mm -hmm. two other editors that came on after her and one of them was specifically just for the trial mm -hmm. footage. So I know that there's some things in the in this adaptation that sort of color it as like, oh, well, I want to present him in this light and that light. And I, I well, according to the French specifically, yeah. I think they were very, very worried. So this is all this all this reporting hit last week on the precipice of episode five coming out, which is what came out last night. Yeah. In episode four, she is kind of being introduced and they were very, very, very concerned as to what five actually entailed because now having seen it, I think that they're a little bit closer than what the, 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 uh, people were worried the about. assumption was exactly yeah. i think they're a little bit closer and, and very much much of the drama between the the french filmmakers in episode five is about them not sure what the documentary says them be becoming aware of her starting to write him at, mm -hmm. uh, after the trial uh and so the conversations about putting their weight on the scale and how much can they affect this and how much can she specifically affect this given the relationship that's kind of forming here that's all out right in the dialogue between mm -hmm. those <laughs> between those characters but it shows her being very very open pretty much to them and it doesn't show her trying to create a narrative it actually shows it shows them arguing about what they about I think what mm -hmm. the pr male producer ends up thinking uh, believing, but at the end of the day, it shows her doing the editor's role, which is giving options and kind of bowing out between the director and the producer, and ultimately it comes down to the director. So, from what I saw as a as a filmmaker, uh, I was primed for this editor to really the character of the editor to run away with the narrative, but I'm not, I'm seeing a little bit more of a, of a real editor an artistic, somebody that's kind of just seeing, seeing that in Michael. And I, I'm, I'm like, by the end of the episode, I'm like starting to buy the romance right. <laughs> in yeah. terms of the drama. But as far as like what you're telling me and what the show is presenting is not, not crazily far off. So I don't know that they, I think that they were very, very concerned that it would, kind of go off the rails as well, soon as she was introduced. I think from their mind, it did go off the rails because Lestrade right. said, he was like, I get it. Of course, if I was Antonio, it adds a new twist and that's why you would do it. But he had said that Sophie had agreed to chat with Antonio only if she was not depicted. And so maybe there was some handshake deal about, uh, hey, you're not going to make this a big piece of this. But then it was. Oh, I think that's why they felt betrayed. And then also- There we go. Gotcha. Lestrade said he got a call from Juliette Binoche who plays Sophie and she's an Oscar winning hmm. French star. And he's like, Oh, this won't be a minor thing. Like he learned oh it from God. her. Hey, I got this role as Sophie. And it's like, Oh, wow. yeah, why would he, ca <laughs> like, yeah. this is going to be a pivotal piece. And I thought we had said that that wasn't what you were going to do with this. So I think that that's why it was more serious. Even mm -hmm. if to the viewer, it seems like, well, that's a crazy revelation, but does it really affect anything? Probably not. In their minds, they were like, you said that you wouldn't question any of the decisions that we made with this. Right. Or, right. you know, um, Campos, though, at Antonio, the show creator, he was like, yeah, including the documentarians was always in it from the very beginning, which I kind of agree with, like you're saying, if he's pitching it to the actors yeah. as such. So that leaves us with kind of a like, who's... Who's right to be mad? Yeah. <laughs> and ultimately, ultimately, I don't know that anybody really is because who's... I Okay, they spent 13 years... They put together an incredible, but they are not the arbiter, lock and key uh, of that story. Yeah. You know, Campos was in, in the room. So <laughs> well, I, I, guess I also, think yeah. ultimately, if I want to hear more from Campos, I want to hear more from the creative team, because if they have found more in the material than what ended up, I mean, that is that now there is a question. Now there is a question looming over this. 
I, everybody that's interested in this is behooved to do a little bit more digging and watch the rest of the show and listen to these filmmakers when they come with their reasons after, because this is unfolding right now. And it's like I said at the top of the show, it's a bit of a food fight and it's going to be a food fight for the next couple of weeks and, and, and especially until the show is done. But I think that it's OK to see another version of this story that widens out this lens. I mean, ultimately, those filmmakers are part of this story and now that is being presented because it is an equally interesting angle to take of we're consuming all of these true crime stories and we want the answers and we want justice and we want to side with a certain side. And it's like, well, somebody is presenting that. So you have to have some sort of a um, perspective. Yeah. Otherwise exactly. it's boring and, if you're just watching and, the court. Like that's why people watch the YouTube highlights of Johnny Depp and Amber Heard because right, right. you can't, it, it's boring to just sit and watch nine hours of a trial. Like, yeah, yeah, you, you, you are coming at it from a perspective and that's what's ongoing. Although, like I said, the book came out in 2019. I also found, I'll post a link. He, Peterson, revealed as far as like Sophie and his relationship and how that's sort of the big bombshell revelation. There's a whole video interview of him talking to the News and Observer and laying everything out, starting with the letters <laughs> of prison, like goes into the fact that they were involved before the second update to it. And then they were broken up and then they were back together. And then she wanted him to move to Paris. And then, all, you know, he like, okay, explains it I all mean, years ago <laughs> that on its sure on it. But that, that says everything to like, well, how widely stretched and talked about the documentary original documentary was and how n little yeah. <laughs> spread anything else was. So yeah, some of this might be out there, but it did not make it to the mainstream. It didn't break on any news. Uh, and and honestly, that what has happened with the show is so, for lack of a better term, like dazzling. Like it's just hit immediately last week that I think everybody's a little bit in shock. And almost to be expected in a case like this where it's like. Right. When I come back to the editor relationship here, it is outrageous, regardless <laughs> of the fact if she thinks, if they think it impacted the, the work on the second half or not regardless if yeah. it did or didn't it doesn't make a difference it's outrageous but they were writing letters <laughs> and, I, and exchanging books and then <laughs> gonna move to paris together yeah <laughs> and that's besides the fact you can say she did the most incredible job and it didn't affect her work and she you know she did the the story service it's still outrageous <laughs> and that's why the show is is here doing that work because it is a worthwhile question. This isn't just some sort of like, uh, to do about nothing. I'm like, yeah. And this is coming from somebody who's like watching it, actually having a little bit easier of judgment on it going like, okay, I can understand that the people types she's from France. What did we just say about Michael Peterson? He needs to go to France. Like <laughs> I understand, I get like they met, I get it. Like they're, they're doing the work. The drama is doing the work of trying to at least tell me how, like why they would be drawn to each other. But ultimately the drama now will be drawn out of like, you have got to step away from the project. Yeah. Uh, regardless of if you think you could do the job. And that's so shocking that I, that, that it, now this is now we're in the middle of it all again. It's <laughs> unfolding for what the third or fourth time again, again. Yeah. And I guess, yeah, to our listeners, does it rub you the wrong way that maybe they got sort of duped the documentarians to now make this thing this way? Because right. they did say, oh, thanks for, you know, <laughs> giving us all this footage. Now we're just going to have this story that is fictionalized and composites and present it as you presented your documentary. Right. Uh, th is there some moral code between artists and, and using their work in that way? Or do you think that the French documentarians are lying? <laughs> <laughs> you think goes you think around they're again. trying to hide? You know, like who knows? Uh, that again, now God, forget about. Do we know if he's guilty or not? Yeah, it's this a whole is, other thing. Now it is a whole other thing. The third uh, dramatization will be between the audience and, and HBO <laughs> itself, you know, and then there'll be some I sort hope of- I we're split. characters. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's all it can oh my do. God. Yeah. <laughs> all right, everybody. This has been a blast. I really appreciate it. Taylor, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Um, guys, I want you to give us a rate and share one of our episodes with somebody when it makes you think about them. Please, it helps us more than you know. And if you ever have a suggestion for an episode, please get in touch with us at at illiteratepod on Instagram or illiteratepod at gmail.com if you're phasing out of the social medias. Either yeah, one. Yeah, I am. I am. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, please reach out to us. You never know when we'll do an episode about that thing you want to know all about. 
and we will be here just like you want us to every Friday. We'll catch you then. See you next week. Thank you.